no one symbolizes China's rapid 30-year rise from the backwaters of communism to the second largest economy in the world better than real estate developer Zhang Xin. What's interesting about her is that while we think of China as being uncreative, repressive, and as far as you can get from the American dream, she breaks every one of those stereotypes. She's a mogul who got her start not in China, but on Wall Street. But she missed the Great Wall, so she went back home and made it big. The story will continue in a moment. The mogul, Zhang Xin, is the fifth richest self-made billionaire woman in the world. This is us, the, the one outside, that one is us. She's pointing out her buildings. With her partner husband, she has built more of Beijing than almost any emperor in China's history. How many buildings have you and your husband built? Oh, you can't a even lot. count them, yeah. right? Wherever you look, you see the company logo, Soho China, on one cutting edge skyscraper after the next. As a developer, Shin pays special attention to design, which is why she's been called the Steve Jobs of the architecture world. Her buildings are fluid and futuristic and daring and would be at home in New York or London, an expression of China's emergence into the modern world. I'm wondering when you see these buildings, if it ever strikes you, and you are designing Beijing. It's a huge responsibility. I feel that. I really do, you? do you feel, feel that. feel it on your shoulders? Oh, yeah, I feel that. I feel these buildings are forming the face of our city. And you build huge buildings and huge projects. That's China, you know. China, if you think about what is the character of China, mm. is enormous scale. Bigness. It's bigness. Everything. She took us to the site of her newest project. Do you love to come out? I love coming out. That's so huge, it's swarming with thousands of workers. These kinds of projects are one reason for China's explosive economic growth. Recently, though, there have been fears of overbuilding and a real estate bubble. Shin told us that's why she keeps her focus narrow. Only office buildings and only in Beijing and Shanghai. My own view is that residential property development in China has really come to an end. You don't feel that there's any threat of a bursting bubble mm -hmm. in commercial real estate in Beijing and Shanghai? I think in retail, like shops, shopping malls, yeah. there is oversupply. But office is doing, is the only property sector that's doing well. Even though the future may be uncertain? The future may be uncertain in terms of, well, the future is always uncertain wherever you go. But more uncertain now. Even if the, the certainty is not 10% growth for China, it goes down to 7% growth, it's still a better place to than your money. <laughs> you think? I think so. You have that much faith? Mm, that's why we're investing heavily. Her business instincts are usually right. They've made her enormously wealthy and a celebrity here. When she opens a new building, it can look like a Hollywood premiere. Yet at 47, she remains grounded and unpretentious, never forgetting she grew up wretchedly poor. She says her personal story shows that China is the new land of opportunity. China is the place that produced more self-made billionaire than any other country in the world. Do you know what the American dream is? Mm -hmm. It sounds like the American dream, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Very much so. How times have changed. Xin was born during the Cultural Revolution when Mao Zedong brutally purged all the capitalists and intellectuals whom he derided as running dogs. And if you were educated, you were almost crushed. Mm. My parents were university graduates. Oh boy, uh, they were in trouble. They were, they were sent to the countryside. I spent years in the countryside uh, as yeah, part of the re-education camp. But call it the revenge of the running dogs. Their children are today the country's leading capitalists. For Shin, it goes back to when she was eight. Her mother was allowed to return to Beijing, where she found work as a translator. But they were destitute and homeless, forced to sleep in an office. I remember we would slip on her desk 
we would use her dictionaries because my mother was a translator as the pillow. You slept on the desktop, dictionary is your pillow? Pillow. Oh my goodness. Yeah, for months we did that. When Shin was 14, she moved to Hong Kong in search of work. But life there was just as hard. She was forced to slave away on assembly lines as a sweatshop girl. On my table, there are like five different chips you need to put on the board. Boom, 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 boom. And then you put on, put on the bell, and then the bell goes down to the next one, right? So we all become like a machine doing that. So this is how you spent your teenage years? Mm, five years doing that. Five years. So do you look upon that as lost years? No. I mean, I, I look at those. It's a different chapter in life. I knew that's not a life I wanted to have. Did you have a dream? No. I wanted just to get just me escape. Out of here. <laughs> right. So when she had saved enough money, she bought a one-way ticket to London, packed up her bags, and left. I thought, I need to cook for myself, so I carry a wok, a Chinese wok. You In know, your when suitcase? You yeah. But forget Chinese food. With no money, she ended up working in a fish and chip stand. Her Dickensian journey wasn't over. I think I was very afraid in England, only because I had never seen so many Caucasians. Funny looking Funny people. Funny looking. Language I didn't understand. Nothing familiar. And you didn't know anybody. Didn't know anybody. I sat on my suitcase, started crying. You end up, no one's going to believe this, you end up working at Goldman Sachs. What a tale from crying and alone to school to learn English, which led to a scholarship to the University of Sussex and then a master's in economics from Cambridge. It was 1992 and Shin's timing was perfect. China was opening its markets to foreign investors. Goldman Sachs sent the sweatshop girl to the mainland to look for opportunities, but she was unhappy in the world of investment banking. I'll give you some of the quotes that you've said. People spoke crassly, treated others badly, looked down on the poor, and adored the rich. Those are your quotes. Mm, that's pretty much true. I mean, I think the investment banking environment was very competitive and cutthroat. I was always looking for opportunities to leave. You wanted to come back to China. I think I was just missing the idealism that I was naively brought up with in the communist, socialist China, when everyone was encouraged and brought out to be idealist. And I guess I was just missing what I, I was brought up with. That's when she met the man she would marry, Pan Shihi. He was part of a wave of young idealists committed to liberalizing China through business. In his case, through a new industry, real estate. And I remember he took me to see a construction site. Uh, it was evening, it was late at night, uh, he took me, he said, you have to come and see what I do. And I went, wow, I had never seen a hole that big on earth. And he told me, this is a place will be the Manhattan of Beijing. Hmm. And I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, because he hasn't been to Manhattan. He had no idea what Manhattan means, right? Uh, a whole bunch of factories in the area, big hole on the ground. This is not going to be a Manhattan of Beijing. But this is where we are now. All this area used to be factory. We stood at that spot in a sea of offices they built. It's not Manhattan. It's bigger. Building after building. Some projects the size of entire neighborhoods. And all built in the last 19 years, going back to the night Shin and Pan first met. Did you really decide to get married in four days? Yeah, we did. And I left my bank, and we joined together, formed the company. With no money, no backing, no relationship. We're n none of us is the sons or the daughters of any China. He wasn't a, prin a princely. No, no. In fact, just the opposite. He came from one of the poorest provinces in China, the most impoverished place. But she and Pan were finding out that mixing how East and West did business was not easy. They fought constantly. And so one day she packed her bags and went back to England. But then she changed her mind. I thought, you know, I cannot just give up like this. I called him up. I said, you know what? I decided to stay in China, stayed in this marriage. I quit the job. I will step aside. I stay at home. 
In her time off, she got pregnant with the first of their two sons, while Pan was making a success of the company. He did so well that there was too much work he couldn't handle. So then he said, you better come back to work. Really, I need you to work. Oh, my goodness. Everything changed from fighting, wanting to get divorced, to starting a family with a baby, and the business is going well, and I'm back to work. Now they split their duties. He focuses on everything inside China. She uses her Wall Street know-how to raise money abroad and hires the world's top architects. Together, they have built Soho China into a company with $10 billion in assets. What about corruption, though? Corruption is, is everywhere in China. It's really quite widespread. Pretty much whoever has a power uh, is uh, in the position to be corrupt. So they expect you to, to pay them off. To pay, pay them off. So how do you operate in this environment? For instance, if we buy a piece of land, if we buy in an auction, then that's very transparent. Openness. Um, openness, more, yeah. Right. The more openness it is, the better it is. We don't need to know anybody. We don't need to be the daughters and sons of anybody. We can just buy with money on, on an open market. That building will stay, and then the rest is all landscape. She believes that open market tools like public auctions and transparent accounting will lessen the corruption and the cronyism. The woman who once slept on a dictionary and now has about $3 billion in her bank account may tout China as the new land of opportunity, but she knows it's still not the land of the free. You know, I hear a lot in the U.S. People praise, you know, Wall Street people praise state capitalism in China. Look at how efficient things get done, decisions get made so quick and so effective. It can roll over a, a policy overnight nationwide. And here in the U.S., we need to go through Congress, Senate, and debate. And right. You know, I have to say, for a Chinese living in China, Chinese, if you ask one thing everyone craves for is what? It's not food, it's not homes. Everyone craves for democracy. <laughs> I know there's a lot of uh, negativities in the U.S. about the political system. But don't forget, you know, 8,000 miles away, people in China are looking at it, longing for it. Do you think there will be democracy here? Let's say I'm going to put a time frame on it. In 20 years? Sooner. You're an optimist. I am. <laughs> A bold statement in a country with heavy government censorship and limited freedom of speech. And while she is thriving, China's residential real estate is in trouble. That part of the story when we return.